Hello again and welcome to our April 2023 edition of Quick Kit. Links to everything that we mention will be down in the description below. This month's edition is quite a long one as NAB has just finished, which means lots of new products have been announced, so grab a drink, get comfy and let's get into it. Blackmagic have announced a whole lot this month. First off, they introduced a new version of the Ursa Mini Pro 12K with the addition of an OLPF. This was something that I did mention in our massive review of the 12K, and it's great to see Blackmagic offer this now for this camera. This OLPF should help reduce artifacts such as moiré and aliasing, which we did notice in our testing. This is a standalone camera, but I am hoping that existing 12K users can have this retrofitted if they would like to, as this new OLPF version has also been approved by Netflix, so performance must have improved. Blackmagic have also released camera update 8.1 for their pocket series of cameras, and this introduces better support for shooting vertical aspect ratio video. When the camera detects that you have rotated it, the on-screen HUD rotates as well. You can also enable frame guides for these aspect ratios, and when you bring your vertical rushes into Resolve, they will automatically be orientated ready to edit in your timeline in your chosen aspect ratio. Version 18.5 of DaVinci Resolve has been introduced, and it brings new AI tools over 150 feature upgrades and new menus on the cut page. There are a lot of changes here, so I've put a link to the press release below and the public beta is available to download now. Next is the new Atom 4 ME Constellation 4K. This features 40 12G SDI with support for standards up to UHD 60p. It has 24 12G AUX outputs, 16 upstream Atom Advanced Chroma keyers, four downstream keyers, four Ultra HD media players and two SuperSource processors. Up next is the Decklink IP, and this is a new series of PCIe cards that can capture and playback 10-bit uncompressed video directly into 2110 IP-based broadcast systems. With this, they also announced the 2110 IP converter 3x3G, a new rack mount converter which converts 3G SDI to 2110 IP broadcast systems. They also announced three new models of the Video Hub 12G Zero Latency Video Routers, a 10x10, a 20x20, and a 40x40. These should eliminate cable mess as you can plug all your SDIs into a router and then do all the connections electronically. You can connect any video input to any video output, which means monitors can view any source that is connected to it. Lastly, they introduced the new Atom Television Studio 4K8, a live production switcher that features eight standards converted 12G SDI inputs. 10 12G SDI AUX outputs, and a 4-port 10 gig switch. It has a very similar feature set to the HD version, but with support for UHD now. Aperture and Amaran have announced a bunch of new kit this month. First off, we have two new Amaran point source LEDs, the 150C and the 300C. These RGBWW LED fixtures have a CCT range of 2500 to 7500 Kelvin, full HSI control, solid photometrics, and you can control it on the rear panel as well as the Silas Link app. The housing looks very clean, but as with most Amaran fixtures, the physical design and build quality is often how they are offered at such a good price point compared to the more robust and professionally aimed Aperture fixtures, but they should still be sturdy enough for most people. Aperture have announced the Light Dome Mini SE and the Spotlight SE, both of which use Bowen's S-mount. I really like the look of the Spotlight SE as it looks like a pretty decent compact and affordable projection kit. Lastly, Aperture released the MC Pro, their pocket-sized LED panel which was teased at NAB last year. This light is aimed at being an upgrade over the original MC and it does have a good few upgrades over it. This includes a substantial bump in output, a magnetic front for different modifiers and an expanded 2000 to 10,000 Kelvin range. It's a bit larger and more expensive compared to the MC but it does come standard with Lumen Radio CRMX control. So whether you need to grab these or the original MC will really come down to what you need the light to do. Angelbird have announced a one terabyte CFexpress type A card, which is priced incredibly well compared to the Sony counterparts. You can get this one terabyte card for 549 pounds, whereas a 320 gigabyte Sony Tough is 559 pounds and a 512GB V90 SD card from Angelbird is £625. The Angelbird card will perform exactly the same as these other cards, so they are definitely worth grabbing over the Sony options if you're happy with shooting onto a 1TB card. Angelbird have also released a Type-A reader, 
which will allow you to take advantage of those sweet fast read and write speeds. This would be a great announcement for anyone using or looking at picking up any of Sony's existing mirrorless cameras that use Type A. We have these in stock right now, so to order yours, head over to our website via the links below. DJI have announced the Inspire 3, their latest flagship fully integrated cinema drone, and it looks amazing. This new drone uses their latest full frame 8K X9 Air camera system that uses the same DL mount that the Ronin 4D and Inspire 2 does. It is rated to capture 14 plus stops of dynamic range, has a dual native ISO of 800 and 4000, and the ability to capture 8K ProRes RAW or Cinema DNG and 4K up to 120 frames per second. It has a new sleeker design, updated TB51 batteries that provide the 28 minute runtime, has a maximum speed of 94 kilometers per hour, and a new range of cameras and sensors across the drone. These new sensors and cameras help improve flight accuracy and safety, and when paired with an RTK system, you can get centimeter level accuracy for positional data. This means you can get very precise with waypoints, which will make repeatable routes very accurate. There is also a 3D dolly mode that allows users to create a path which you can manually follow along while fully controlling the camera system. These new modes look really interesting. It also has a low latency POV camera on the front for the pilot to use instead of using the camera feed. It can also now output two independent 1080p 60 feeds up to 15 kilometers or output 4K in a reduced range mode. It also has timecode support and can be used with DJI's pro accessories such as the master wheels and follow focus system. It's definitely pricey at just over 13 grand, but it does look like it offers a whole lot of powerful features and tools and the image quality that I've seen looks great. Ari have announced the ZMU4, their new and improved zoom command, and it looks awesome. This unit can be used both wired and wirelessly, which makes it a bit different from other zoom demands. It uses the same interchangeable radio modules as the Hi5, so you can choose different radio modules for different regions and shooting situations really easily. It can also act as a radio module for other LBUS control devices such as the OCU-1, which means you can easily use this device to control iris and zoom from a single setup. It has two ARRI rosette mounts for easily mounting accessories or mounting it into different configurations, as well as traditionally on tripod pan handles. It also has a little screen on it, which allows you to use the large array of buttons to configure the unit exactly as you need it to, such as setting zoom speed, as well as markers and limits. It looks like a really robust and versatile system that I'm sure plenty of productions will be using as they start hitting end users' hands. We took a look at the first three Atlas Mercury lenses back in February, and at NAB this year, Atlas had their latest focal length on show, the 54mm T2.2. This is the first lens of the second group of Mercury lenses, which will consist of a 54, 95 and 138 millimeters, bringing the full set to a pretty well fleshed out six lenses. These lenses are incredibly light and compact professional full frame 1.5 times front mounted anamorphic lenses that are reasonably accessible for filmmakers to acquire or rent. Optically, I love the way that these lenses look and I'm really excited to see the three new focal lengths in person when I can. If you missed our review of the first three, make sure to check it out. DZO has shown off a few new products at NAB this year. Let's start off with one we heard rumblings of at BSC, their new two times anamorphic Super 35 cinema lenses. These look super compact for two times anamorphics. And according to Cine D, the anamorphic element is placed right behind the focusing group. At release, there will be six focal lengths available, 28, 32, 40, 55, 75, and 100 millimeters all of which are T2.1. There will be two different flare options, which will be blue and then either golden or neutral, and you'll be able to tell what flare is what by the color of the housing. Dieselow hasn't announced pricing yet, but I am very intrigued to see how they look on camera, as they could be a great new option for people to consider picking up. Dieselow also had their new 25-300mm T2.8 12 times cinema zoom on show as well. I remember seeing this at NAB years ago, but it was under the Photon brand, not DZO. Depending on the price, this could be quite interesting. Lastly, they announced their new Tango zooms, which consists of a Super 35 18 to 90 mm T2.8 and a 65 to 280 mm T2.8 to 3.5, both of which have a built-in servo unit. There aren't loads of options in the more cine focus servo zoom lens market, so this is actually quite nice to see. I just wonder how they are going to be priced. 
Lauer had their new range of full frame cinema zooms on show at Anib this year. This includes a 28 to 75 and a 75 to 180 mm, both of which are T2.9. They actually looked really compact given their decent focal range and image circle. I've been waiting to see a decently compact 24 to 70 ish cine zoom lens hit the market for a while now, and if these perform well optically, they could be a fantastic option for a range of applications. They come PL as standard, but have an interchangeable mount that can be swapped to EF, have a 77mm filter thread with an 80mm front diameter, and are claimed to be parfocal. I can't wait to check these out properly and hear pricing, as I think they could be incredibly popular. Lauer also announced four new focal lengths for their Proteus series of 2x anamorphics. This includes a 20mm, 28mm, 100mm and 135mm, all of which are T2, apart from the 100mm, which is T2.1. At NEB, Tilter announced their new Nucleus Nano 2 follow focus system. The Nucleus M and Nano have been incredibly popular, and this new system is going to be priced the same as the original Nano, which is pretty awesome. This new unit can now control up to three FIS motors, has a new display on the side for displaying crucial shooting information, and features a new lens profile system so you can map and store your lenses to make lens swaps on set faster. You will also be able to connect a handle which will allow you to control all three channels, a gimbal as well as a camera. It will also be compatible with their new wirelessly controllable lighting yoke, which is another really interesting product they announced at NAB. It has an internal battery which should last for roughly 7 hours and has a USB-C for charging and external power. It will also work with all of the existing motors from the previous Tilt systems, so you can easily take advantage of the new features of the Nano 2 with your previous system. This looks great, especially for the price, and I'm super excited to see an updated Nucleus M from them as well. Sennheiser have released their new EWDP wireless audio system, which is replacing the incredibly popular Sennheiser G4. The G series from Sennheiser has been an industry standard for years, due to their ease of use, reliability, and overall quality. And this new EWDP carries on the prestige, but updates it for the modern age. The EWDP is a fully digital system that uses the UHF spectrum, which greatly enhances range and reliability over other digital systems that use 2.4 GHz. It's also a much smarter system than the previous G4s, as it has Bluetooth connectivity for synchronization and control, as well as smart app notifications via the Smart Assist app for troubleshooting and auto frequency coordination, which makes it all just much easier to use. It features a new magnetic mounting system, 134 decibels of dynamic range, and improved battery life and powering options with live runtime readouts. We've managed to use it a good bit, and it really is an awesome system that is super easy to use. Canon has announced a bunch of new stuff this month. First off, they announced two new flex zooms. These new lenses are essentially Super 35 versions of their existing full frame flex zooms. Canon have done this by changing the rear block of the lens, which you can have done by a Canon service center. This means that the full frame lenses go from a 20 to 50 mm and 45 to 135 mm T2.4 to a 14 to 35 and 31.5 to 95 mm T1.7. This means that they have the same look and feel of the existing flex zooms, but of course with that change in focal length and incredibly fast aperture. You can buy a conversion kit for the full frame flexes to go from Super 35 or just the Super 35 versions of them themselves. This update to these lenses makes sense as it makes the lenses a bit more versatile, especially for rental houses who want to switch them around for different productions needs. Up next, they announced their latest zoom, the RF 100-300mm f2.8 LIS USM. While this lens is pricey at just under £11,500, it will be an appealing one to many sports and wildlife photographers and videographers who want a surprisingly compact and light versatile zoom with a constant f2.8 aperture. It has optical stabilisation, which should offer up to 5.5 stops of correction, a lens control ring and a 9 blade aperture. It is also compatible with the 1.4 and 2x RF extenders, so you can turn it into a 140-420 f4 or 200-600 f5.6 while still getting full focus speed and reliability. It also looks decently compact and lightweight given the zoom range that it has. Canon has also announced that they are developing a new ultra low light camera, the MS500. This looks like a pretty unique camera that's being developed more for industrial use than video or cinema, but it's interesting nonetheless. 
I remember testing the ME20 years ago and it blew me away with what it could see in the dark. And I'm sure this will be the case with this camera too. Canon have also announced a bunch of new firmware updates for a range of their Cinema EOS cameras. This includes updates for the R5C, C70, C400 Mark III and C500 Mark II. The R5C update includes improved autofocus performance, a new power save mode, and the time to switch between photo and video mode has been reduced by roughly 40% from photo to video and 70% from video to photo. The updates for the other cameras are a bit more minor, but will still be great for existing camera owners. However, the R5C update is pretty great. Fingers crossed it comes out soon. And lastly, Netflix have announced that the R5C has been added to their approved camera list, which is good news. Sony has released a bunch of new kit alongside new firmware this month. The new firmware is for the FX3 and FX30, and it brings some awesome new updates and features. First off, we have the addition of an in-camera de-squeeze option. This is something that's been missing from Sony cameras for a while now, but this update is still quite limited as you only have options for 1.3 and two times squeezes. When in this mode, you can only shoot in log, you have no stabilization and no autofocus. Fingers crossed this is something that Sony continued to develop. It would be great to see expanded options with different recording formats and more de-squeeze options. Panasonic have been doing anamorphic support right for so many years now, and it'd be great to see Sony doing the same. You also now have the option for true 24p and DCI 4K recording options. S and Q modes can now be switched via a custom button. Camera ID and real number are now formatted the same as Sony's higher end cameras. And the FX3 has had Sony's breathing compensation mode added as well. So this is a pretty great update, but I feel like these features need to be added to the rest of Sony's mirrorless cameras as there are plenty of the alpha cameras that people use as their primary video camera out there. Fingers crossed we see more updates from Sony soon. Next they announced two new PTZ cameras. First off, the SRG A12, a 4K PTZ that has built-in AI features for subject tracking and framing. It can capture up to 4K30, has a 12x optical zoom, and has all the regular inputs and outputs and features you'd expect from a PTZ system. The SRG A40 is the same camera, apart from the change from a 12x optical zoom to a 40 times, and this is reflected in the price. Up next is their latest broadcast camera, the HTC 5500V which features a 4K 2 3rd inch 3 CMOS sensor with the ability to output 4K in a range of ways. It also has a dual ND system, which is pretty unique. It has a traditional wheel-based 2 to 5 stop, and then the same electronic variable ND that's featured in the FX6 or FX9. This means you can put the variable ND into auto and port iris while maintaining exposure, which is pretty unique for this camera. And it's the first kind of system I've seen like this in any camera where you have the variable and the normal stepped ND. Next are two new monitors, the BVM HX3110 and the LMD A180. The HX3110 is their latest flagship monitor aimed at being used for the most professional color critical work. It features a dual layer LCD panel, which helps achieve a peak luminance of 4,000 nits while still having very deep blacks. The A180 is an 18.4 inch full HD production monitor. And lastly, they've released a new set of open back studio headphones, the MDR MV1. Rode also announced a bunch of new kit this month. This started with the new firmware for the Rodecaster Pro 2 that will allow the use of wireless microphones like the GoTo directly from the transmitter to the unit, which is pretty awesome. The first new product announcement was the Rodecaster Duo. This features a smaller footprint than the regular Rodecaster, but has the same preamps, two XLR mic inputs, a range of tactile controls, a nice screen, and high quality revolution preamps and Aphex audio processing for good sound quality. The Streamer X is a new product aimed at streamers who want an audio interface and video capture card in one. It looks like a really nice solution for this as well. It has two USB-C connections for dual PC setups, a XLR combo port, the ability to capture 4K30 with a 4K60 pass-through, and four customizable smart pads. It's decently priced considering what it can do, so it could be a good option for content creators to consider. The pod mic has been a very popular option for podcasters and streamers, and Rode have just released an updated version of it, the pod mic USB. This has both a three pin XLR output and a USB-C port, so you can connect it however you need to. The USB-C output uses a revolution preamp to provide good sounding audio over this output. They also released the Rodecaster backpack, which Looks like a really nice way for people who travel with their podcasting setup to lug their kit around safely. 
it looks like you can store all of the key components you need to really nicely. And lastly, they announced a charging case for the Wireless Go 2, which could be a great pickup for people traveling with their Wireless Go 2s. Right, let's get into our quick fire honorable mentions. Links to details about these are in the description below. Axoon have released the Simu Pro SDI. It's basically a more robust Simu with the ability to take an SDI input. They have teamed up with Zakuto to create an EVF solution, and they have worked with Switcher Studio to add integration for the Simu. Ari have announced the Tally System Gen 2 and CCP Live. AutoQ has announced a new range of teleprompters, the Explorer, Pioneer, and Navigator series. Cartoni released the Lifto 24 elevation column. Core SWX released the Renegade series of power stations, and they also showed off their new wall mounted battery charger, the Wall Link, which has app based monitoring. Crosial showed off their focus motor system for the Sony FR7. DAT announced the PR2, their new 32 bit float recording pocket audio recorder, and their Theos wireless audio set. This features a dual channel receiver, uses the UHF spectrum, has a built in 32 bit float recorder, and can be wirelessly synced with their TC1 generator. DJI announced the Goggles Integra and the RC Motion 2 controller for their Avata FPV drone. Doolens have announced their new compact lens projector, the MF60. Freefly have released new versions of their Movi Carbon systems that use the Panasonic BGH1 and BS1H cameras. Hollyland announced the Venus Pro and Air Live cameras and the M1 Pro 7 inch wireless monitor. IDX announced the RMC2 Lank Fizz controller. Kipon announced Mamiya LPL focal reducer adapters and their new Bavier's 2x Cine extender. Lumen Arc announced the Active Diffusion System, which looks really interesting. Marshall has introduced a range of new compact cameras. Matthews have announced their Light Mover, a universal mount for remote light adjustment. Miller has announced the Cinex 8 and Cinex 9, as well as the Cinex 20, 23, and 25 fluid heads. These all range in size and feature set. Mutiny have launched a version of their Bolton V2 RS trigger for Canon cameras. Nitty launched the Athena range of full frame T1.9 cinema lenses that look a little bit familiar. Nanlux have released the Evoque 900C, a 940 watt RGB ACL LED fixture. Red has released a new beta for CineX Pro, which adds the automatic mask line adjust that we mentioned in our XL video. They also announced the Connect module pack for the Raptor and XL, which opens up the ability to stream 8K from these cameras. Rig Wheels have announced their new PTZ camera vibration isolator. Samyang have announced the 35 to 150 mm f2 to 2.8 lens for Sony E mount cameras. Shape has shown off their latest generation of handles at NAB. Sigma have announced three new contemporary lenses the 17 mm f4, 50 mm f2, and 23 mm f1.4, all of which are available in Sony E or Panasonic L mount. Smorig have released a couple of new handles, their new Freeblazer carbon tripod and a manual follow focus system, the F60. Swip released a bunch of new products, the Wave 500, Volta floor battery, K7 monitor, Matrix wall mount charger, and their latest UHD 31.5 inch monitor, the BM U325MD. Tentacle showed off their new time bar at NAB 2023, Tilter were also showing off their new Hydra Arm motorized slider, which looks pretty crazy. Teradek released the Ranger Micro and Ranger Mark II wireless video systems. Next is the lens cuff, which allows for the mounting of fizz motors on bars via an attachment on the lens. Vocas has announced a new range of V-Raptor accessories. Vaxis have announced a TX Cradle for the LX35 and the OpenCom V1 duplex headset. Wooden Camera has introduced the Elite Accessory Ecosystem for the Venice 2 and the Rialto. And lastly, Zakuta introduced the Micro Mixer, Rotator, and Micro Boom. Well, that was quite a long one. I'm very impressed you made it this far into the video, so thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, please make sure to subscribe ready for next month's quick kit. And let us know what kit you've picked up this month in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching.